And so we have developed for ourselves habit patterns of sin. Jesus had the same inherited tendencies, but he never developed the same propensities since he never sinned. He never laid the foundation. He never developed those propensities. George Knight introduced the idea in his first presentation, and if you have your notebooks, to page 8, um, of the Andreasen Final Generation Sanctuary Theology, which he um, criticizes, as I understand it, as leading at least a portion of Adventism down the wrong track. And I will read a portion of a paragraph, because I'm going to contrast it with, a, with another paragraph, and then ask our panelists to comment on the contrast. Page 8, um, George Knight characterizes his theology this way. Using the widely held concept that Christ had sinful human nature just like Adam possessed after the fall, that is, a sinful nature with tendencies to sin, Andreasen formulated his understanding of last generation theology with Christ being an example of what could be accomplished in the lives of his followers. That theology is most clearly set forth in the chapter entitled The Last Generation in the Sanctuary Service. That book specifically states that Satan was not defeated at the cross, but would be defeated by the last generation in their demonstration that an entire generation of people could live a sinlessly perfect life. Christ, in their human nature, with all its problems, had proven that it could be done. They could live the same sinlessly perfect life that he did with the same help as he did. Through the last generation, God defeats Satan and wins his case. In the remnant, Satan will meet his defeat. Through them, God will stand vindicated. At that point, Christ can come. Now, I want to contrast that with a quote found in, um, or compare, compare or contrast with a quote found in um, the paper given by Larry Kirkpatrick. And he uses a couple of Ellen White quotes. And it's on page, I didn't mark it in my, uh, in my book because I'd separately written both quotes down ahead of time. So I will just read them from where I've written them down. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent efforts, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon earth. When this work shall have been accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. And he follows that with a second quote from Desire of Ages, but because they're quite similar, I won't read the second one in the interest of time, but you can read it in your book if you desire. I would note that that quote is from Great Controversy, the 1911 edition, and the two quotes are 200 pages apart. I say that to point out that this is taken from a major work of Ellen White, 
a late work of Ellen White and appears, I could give a, a number of other similar quotations throughout that book. It is not an isolated comment of hers. So I read those quotes to set up the question, which is, are these statements and views Andreasen's Final Generation Theology and the quotes that I've just read here about Ellen White, the cleansing of the sanctuary and a final generation overcoming sin, are these similar views or are they dissimilar views? Woody. Similar or dissimilar? Dissimilar. Uh, absolutely dissimilar. It's a uh, claptrap of stuff that's all been slung together with all sorts of assumptions. I do not find this in Ellen White. In fact, I find Ellen White militating against this final generation. What about the quote that I just read? No, I'd no, like you to no, engage no. that. She does not say there that God is dependent upon a final generation to get him off the hook of the charges no. of the devil. Okay. So and you're by making the way, a distinction between... You're, you accept that Ellen White says there'll be a final generation with a special experience. I don't have any problem with a final generation. I wish we already been a final generation. I wanted to go to heaven a long it has time a, ago. A, a, an experience with victory over sin and perfection, but it's not relating to vindicating God. Or he doesn't need us to vindicate him. We desperately need him to vindicate us. Okay. For crying out loud. Now, uh, behave, guys. All right. Let's don't, be so dis let's don't be so passionate here, all right? <laughs> look. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, look, have, look. Uh, let's have respectful. Uh, we can yep. applaud the panelists at the end, all right? Yep. Thank yep. you. Yep. Look, look. Let's, uh, let Woody finish his thought. Look, look. I'm not sure because I was yep. distracted, so let him say it again. What, what, what I just said was, I not only do not find final generation vindication in Ellen White, I find her militating against it. And, the key, and you guys don't own the great controversy theme. It's yours. I'm glad to share it with you, and I know you're glad to share it with me. But you, the great controversy theme is a terrific theme. It's central. It is based on the issue of God's love. That's what's contended. Mm -hmm. But I do not find this final generation vindication stuff in Ellen White. In fact, in the chapter in Desire of Ages where she gives us the most succinct resume of the great controversy theme, that's it is finished. She later says every issue was essentially settled, was essentially settled because of what Christ did in his life and his death. And I think it borders on the anthropocentric arrogance. Almost blasphemous. Please, with all respect, I'm here you using that in the sense. I'm using that in the sense, why should we as human beings claim to try to do something that the God man has already done? That's us taking the place of Christ. It's almost anti-Christ. He has settled these issues. Plus, I find it ironic that you say Jesus is so much like us. For crying out loud, if he's that much like us and he won the victory, what else is there to prove? What else is there to prove in principle to meet the challenges of the devil?